on behalf of the department of english university of gorbongo let me welcome you all to this new session of the online lecture series that we are organizing i wish a very good morning to our esteemed speaker for this session professor ramon ja fontaine who is joining us from the states and a very good evening to all our participants our attendees you know today ramon is going to talk about a very very pertinent issue he is talking about the aids pandemic we all know that because of the ongoing covid pandemic we are now we have the incentive to revisit texts that dealt with the aids pandemic and you know today in his lecture ramond is going to talk about gay theater in the united states and he is going to focus on aids and the cultural rhythm we all know that aids is a very serious disease even though today we can live with aids we can cope with aids because of the triple cocktail the ramifications of aids on society and on individuals was really very very serious and life changing so today Raymond is going to refer to five playwrights and six texts. In the in the main, he is going to talk about Angels in America, Love, Valor, and Compassion. Love, Valor, Compassion, Mothers and Sons, and the Inheritance. But he may also refer in the passing. to the normal heart and baltimore waltz we are really eager to listen to lemon ja fontaine one of our old friends so without further ado let me now request professor lemon john ja fontaine to address us over to you lemon thank you thank you good evening and i had sent professor abhatacharya a handout a bibliography which i hope you were able to uh, disseminate since i don't have a blackboard to write names on i was hoping that that would um help you with american playwrights who may not be familiar to you okay. 5 years ago I was seated next to the playwright Terence McNally on stage following a regional performance of his play Corpus Christi and during the talk back with the audience a young woman the very first question was Mr McNally you talk about aids what is that I've heard it I've heard about it but I don't know what it is. McNally looked at me confused because he could not imagine anyone did not know what AIDS was. And I had to tell him all of the students in the audience were born after 1995. when the triple cocktail made aids a manageable condition and so whereas men of my generation had to deal on a daily basis with the trauma of aids for over 15 years the students that i am now teaching have absolutely no idea <laughs> of what the um uh, of the historical and the social 
and the psychological and the cultural backgrounds are. It was, for those of you who are, and I can tell by the faces that are appearing on my computer screen, uh, some of you seem uh, significantly younger than I am. So let me remind you, in the United States, on July 3rd, 1981, a one-column article appeared deep inside the New York Times, the headline for which was 41 gay men suffer from an unusual form of cancer. And scientists had no idea what to think about this. The men were all in their 20s and 30s, yet they were being diagnosed with Carposi's sarcoma, a form of cancer that previously had only occurred in elderly men in the Eastern Mediterranean, largely Greek, Turkish, Israeli. And medical specialists could not figure out why was this cancer appearing now in New York City, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Those were the three cities where it was first observed. Within two years, hysteria had broken out in the United States. Because until scientists were able to isolate the virus, which became called HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, until scientists could isolate the virus and understand its pathology, people had no idea how AIDS could be transmitted. The, some of the social uh, changes that we associate with the AIDS pandemic in the early 1980s are simple things like in public restrooms, they started putting out uh, light paper toilet seat covers so that if you were using a public toilet, you could cover the seat for fear that you might catch AIDS from a toilet seat. If you've ever seen the television program, Frasier, one of the recurring jokes is that Niles, Frasier's brother, is very fussy and he refuses to touch a bathroom door handle. He stands waiting for someone else to come in or to leave the restroom because he's afraid of catching a disease from the door handle. Dentists started wearing plastic gloves when they, before they put their fingers in your mouth because they were afraid they might get AIDS from you, from a patient, and the patient was afraid the dentist might give them AIDS. It was only in late 1983 that a group of French medical investigators were able to isolate the virus and to map how it was transmitted through vital fluids, most particularly blood and semen. And we were able to take different kinds of precautions. In the United States and Western Europe, because the gay community became the primary host community for the virus. 
people began distinguishing between innocent victims and they never said that gays were guilty or deserving victims. But the thought was, if a 12-year-old boy who was hemophiliac and is infected through blood clotting um, a therapy that he must take, or an 80-year-old woman gets AIDS through a blood transfusion when she undergoes hip replacement surgery, the thought was that they were innocent victims and gays were guilty victims because they were contracting it through uh, sexual intercourse. If you're interested in the hysteria that sur and the horrible fear and anxiety that surrounded AIDS in the early years of the epidemic, the first book on my bibliography by Randy Schiltz and the band Played On is a riveting historical chronology day by day, week by week, of how the pandemic um, expanded in uh, the United States and Europe. Now, why were gays the primary host com community in, uh, the, in the US, whereas in Africa, AIDS was disseminated largely through heterosexual contact, not homosexual contact. And it's quite simply because in 1969, with the, what we call the Stonewall Revolution, there was a determination among gay men and lesbians who had been forced to disguise their sexual orientation for so many years in order to escape social ostracism. Following Stonewall, there was a new determination to be as open and as free as possible. The fact that it was between 1969 and 1981 just a 12-year period for AIDS to take root in the gay community and to explode into a pandemic tells us how effective that sexual revolution was in the Western world. Before 1969, if you look at how homosexuality is represented on stage, it is always as a secret or as a problem. If you look at plays like Arthur Miller's All My Sons or Robert Anderson's Tea and Sympathy, or Tennessee Williams's Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. The question surrounds one of the key male characters. Is he gay or isn't he? And in all three instances, by the end of the play, the audience is assured he's not gay, he's just confused. Tennessee Williams was forced to change the ending of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof from a very ambivalent one. Will Brick and Maggie reconcile or won't they? To a much more positive one where Brick invites Maggie to go up to the bedroom with him. Assuring audiences that there is no question that Brick is heterosexual, not homosexual. 
Likewise, in Robert Anderson's Tea and Sympathy, which takes place at a boy's prep school, a sensitive poetry-loving boy is taunted for being gay. And at the end of the play, the headmaster's wife famously says, as she leads him into the bedroom to make a man out of him, when you think of this in the future, and I know you will, please think kindly of me. The sensational aspect of the play was that a middle-aged woman would sexually indoctrinate a teenage boy in order to reassure him that he wasn't gay. In the early stages of post-war American drama, homosexuality could only be presented as a secret or as a problem. After 1969, though, there was an extraordinary explosion of open, uh, 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 of, of frank representations of gay men on stage. The groundbreaking play, of course, was Mark Crowley's the Boys in the Band, which appeared off-Broadway in 1968 and just had a 50th anniversary revival on Broadway with an all-star cast, all of them open gay actors, including um, uh, Jim Parsons, who is on a popular American television program called The Big Bang Theory. Uh, it's just been made into a film, and so you may be able to see it uh, this way. But Mark Crowley gave 12 gay men on stage on a Saturday night, and one was and audiences for the first time saw how gay men spoke and interacted. The fact that they all appear straight at work and in their larger social lives continued the theme of keeping homosexuality a secret. But by taking us into the living room of a gay man and all of his gay friends who are gathered for a birthday party, Mark Crowley, for the first time, was presenting homosexuality unapologetically. It was an incredible breakthrough in American theater. That only 12 years later, the AIDS epidemic should break out and things would change so dramatically is what we're talking about this evening. It is difficult at this distance to understand the impact, the devastating impact that AIDS had on the gay community in the 1980s and 90s. David French, who has the last book in the first part of the bibliography, How to Survive a Plague, uh, uh, an, an epidemic, sorry, I don't have it in front of me. Um, but David French reports that between 1981 and 2012, the last year that um, statistics were available as he was writing his book, over 658,000 deaths in the United States alone were due to AIDS, and that 100,000 of these deaths 
were in New York City alone. New York City became ground zero for the AIDS epidemic in the United States. If you want to know what it was like at the time, here is a scene from the play, The Inheritance by Matthew Lopez, which ironically was forced to close in March as the COVID pandemic shut down all the theaters in New York City. In The Inheritance, 12 young gay men, all of whom were born after 1995, ask an older gay man, what was it like at the time? Eric says, I can't imagine what those years were like. I can understand what it was, but I cannot possibly feel what it was. And Walter, the older gay man, who's at a dinner party with these 12 younger men, says, tell me the name of your closest friends. And now I have to do all the voices. You have to realize there are 13 actors on stage And they're all just giving one name after another. And Walter tells you what would have happened to your friend 25 years earlier. Okay, so Tristan. Imagine that Tristan is dead. Name another. Jasper. Jasper is also dead. Jason. Jason has been at St. Vincent's, a hospital in Manhattan, for two weeks The toxoplasmosis has left him with dementia. Jason, his husband, because they cannot legally be married, abandonment is simpler. Jason has left him. Patrick is dead. Alex is dead. Colin is dead. Lucas is infected. Zach is dying from pneumocystis carini. Chris is healthy, but his partner has just been diagnosed. You just visited Mark in the hospital. Tonight, you will visit Will. Eddie's funeral is tomorrow. Michael's body is covered with KS lesions. And it goes on for another page uh, before it finishes this way. Rumors fly about in Carson incarcerations of gay men as a precaution. Politicians begin to openly discuss mass quarantines. There is talk of outlawing homosexuality, rumors of deportations. Anti-gay violence is on the rise. The American public becomes galvanized by the epidemic, not against the illness, but against the people who have it. Businesses cancel health insurance policies for employees with AIDS. States pass legislation requiring home sellers to divulge if a person with AIDS has ever lived there. And it goes on and on. And finally, this is the end of Act One. Walter says, that is is what it was like. And the stage froze and complete blackout in the theater. It was a devastating moment theatrically, especially to see the younger men on stage finally coming to understand the emotional drama, the trauma that older generations had lived through. Now, how does one respond to this kind of devastation? Um, I, I, I isolate three general responses that we can associate with a three groundbreaking plays. Larry Kramer's The Normal Heart is a Jeremiad. It's a political screed. It just had its 25th or 30th anniversary revival on Broadway. 
and prove just as powerful as the original production because they did the backstage. It seemed to be a translucent screen at the start of the play. But as each new scene began, more names of the dead were added to the screen until by the end of the play, every portion of the stage, the back and the two sides and the floor had names of the gay dead written on it. Larry Kramer, who just died uh, a few months ago, uh, Larry Kramer is not a very artful playwright. Um, word is that he wrote a play that was 400 pages long, and Joe Papp, the great director, had to cut it down into the very effective theater uh, that uh, we see on the screen now. But the normal heart is this outcry of pain and suffering asking why are politicians, particularly uh, President Reagan, who was in office at the time, and New York City Mayor Ed Koch, who ironically was gay, but deeply, deeply closeted and was afraid to do anything uh, to help gays in New York City, lest he be accused, lest he be outed. Likewise, with President Reagan, the thought was that his youngest son at the time was a ballet dancer. <laughs> and if Reagan did anything to help people with AIDS, everyone, it would call attention to the ambivalent sexuality of his son. And so Reagan allowed the AIDS epidemic to rage unchecked for eight years, much as Donald Trump is allowing the COVID pandemic to rage unchecked in the United States today. A second response we can associate with Tony Kushner, whose Angels in America became a metaphysical meditation. Uh, it's the most important American play since Edward Albee's The Zoo Story, or maybe even Tennessee Williams, A Streetcar Named Desire. Angels in America is a meditation on how civilization progresses through pain and suffering. You have all of these um, as subplots of the Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe who escaped the shettles and the pogoms by coming to the United States and settling in Brooklyn and the Bronx. You have or the, the Mormons who migrated westward and what they had to suffer along the way, colonizing the Western uh, states in America. You even have what was the most radical, unorthodox image of the play, that God himself so dislikes stasis, he's abandoned heaven and the angels and has gone on the road looking for new experiences. 
stasis, Tony Kushner argues, is death. The only way we know we're alive is if we're changing, if we're being pummeled by new circumstances that force us to respond and to grow as human beings. There is a horrendous image in the play when one of the characters asks, how do we change? And the Mormon mother says, well, I can tell you, but it's not a very nice story. God picks you up and with a dirty fingernail slices you from neck to groin, reaches in, pulls all your innards out, and leaves you to put them back together and to heal. What was AIDS, Tony Kushner's play argues? The trauma of AIDS is something a necessary trauma that forces us to find a way to move forward. And Angels in America just had an extraordinary 25th anniversary revival on stage with Nathan Lane and uh, Spider-Man, Andrew Garfield in the main roles. The third response I associate with Terence McNally's love, valor, uh, compassion, but I'll read a, a, a speech <clears throat> from his more recent play, Mothers and Sons. Mothers and Sons revisits a play McNally had written 30 years earlier called Andre's Mother. Andre's mother takes place at a memorial service for a young man named Andre. It was only 12 minutes on stage. It was written as part of a benefit, but was expanded when it was filmed for, for American television. In the play, Cal is mourning the death of his partner, Andre, and at the gravesite, he's talking to Andre's mother, who incredibly never says a word in the play. And it is Cal arguing with his dead partner's mother, why did you abandon him? Why did you refuse to acknowledge he was gay? Now that he's dead, you'll never be able to reconcile with him. At, he finally leaves the stage in frustration. And for the first time in the play, the actress moves. And we're told simply that tears come running down her face. And she releases a white balloon. Uh, in the 90s, at AIDS memorial services, very often you released a white balloon as though you were releasing the spirit of your loved one. Well, when the play was done in the late 80s, it was incredibly powerful. In 2015, McNally returned to the situation and 25, 30 years later, Cal is now married to another gay man. They have a son through in vitro fertilization. And Andre's mother shows up unexpectedly one day. <laughs> and they finally have it out. She wouldn't say anything in Andre's mother, but now she can't stop talking her anger, and she says, I've come to see if you're dead. I wanted to know if you're the person who gave AIDS to Andre. And Cal says, no, I don't know 
how Andre contracted AIDS, but I have always tested negative. And she loses her temper and says to him, didn't you want to know? I would have found out and I would have killed the man who killed Andre. And this is the speech. This is Cal's response. I was in enough pain of my own. Andre was dying. I couldn't save him. Everyone was dying. I couldn't save any of them. Nothing could. Something was killing us. This is, you have to imagine this is before um, uh, uh, protease inhibitors, the triple cocktail. Um, everyone talked about it, but no one did anything. What could killing one another have accomplished? There was so much fear and anger in the face of so much death, and no one was helping us. It wasn't time to hate. We learned to help each other help each other in ways we never had before. It was the first time I ever felt a part of something, a community. <laughs> so thank you for that, I suppose. I wanted to kill the world when Andre was diagnosed, but I took care of him instead. I bathed him, I cleaned him up and told him I loved him even when he was ashamed of what this disease had done to him. He wasn't very beautiful when he died, Mrs. Gerard. <laughs> Our very own plague took care of that. Andre had slept with someone other than me, but I had to forgive him. He was one of the unlucky ones. And his mother said, well, it's your fault that you weren't faithful. And he says, we weren't allowed to take marriage vows. It wasn't even a possibility. Relationships like mine and Andre's weren't supposed to last. We didn't deserve the dignity of marriage. Maybe that's why AIDS happened. McNally, in a series of plays that culminated in Mothers and Sons, McNally insisted that instead of, like Larry Kramer, one rail against injustice and demand um, equal rights, one simply treat everyone one knows with love, with valor, and with compassion. The key words in the title of his most famous AIDS play. What has interested me this, uh, the past 30 years, what has long interested me is the fact that out of this horrendous devastation and loss, gay theater should have reinvented itself. AIDS, as Kushner says, demanded change. And theater proved the most valuable medium to explore, to advocate, to witness that change. Kushner's Angels in America reinvented American theater and the way we tell stories. 25 years later, the recent revival on Broadway showed that Kushner's dramaturgy, his mixing of the fantastic with the deeply realistic, his allowing to actions to take place on stage at once, commenting upon uh, the one commenting the other. 
His dramaturgy is as explosive today as it was in the early 90s. William Finn's falsetto, which likewise just enjoyed a 20th anniversary revival, gave us a musical comedy about loss, climaxing with the death of the one partner in a hospital room as the two lovers sing, what would I do if I hadn't met you, which has the most soaring vocal line in American musical theater as these two voices combine, sing above and underneath one another, enacting the power of male love. And McNally's Love, Valor, Compassion took the story of the ballet Swan Lake, a romantic meditation on love and death by another great gay artist, Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky, to create community. The closing image of love, valor, compassion remains one of the most extraordinary moments that I have ever experienced in the theater. As six gay men strip naked and walk out into a moonlit lake after a horrendous lightning storm. They join hands as they walk into the lake and the stage had created, they had created the lake on stage and they moved around a bend and disappeared from sight. And it was McNally's way of saying this is how we escort one another through death into the unknown. We do it as a community with love, valor, compassion. We hold hands and reinforce one another. Um, Matthew Lopez's The Inheritance, which has uh, all of these plays have been filmed. You can find them on video, except for The Inheritance, which, as I say, just closed on Broadway six months ago, asked how can, how do gay men learn from one another to tell their story? By bringing on stage the long dead novelist, E.M. Foster, <laughs> and they argue with him why he could not publish the novel Morris in his lifetime but what they have to learn from his novel, Howard's End. The Inheritance is a gay rewriting of Howard's End. Uh, and Act One finishes with this, it's just brilliant dramaturgy as the lead character finally gets to visit the country house that is, you know, it gives its, its name to the title of Foster's novel. He's alone on stage and suddenly all of the ghosts of the gay dead who died in this house walk up through the audience and silently form a circle around him. It was one of those few moments when suddenly, in, in the theater, when suddenly the stage goes dark and the audience could not applaud. People were so emotionally devastated, they sat in their seats for seven, eight, nine, ten seconds, and then <laughs> the applause began, and it was thunderous. 
this is how culture works, making for us moments of renewal out of our most heartbreaking loss, reinventing itself generically to meet new pressing demands. As Cal says in McNally's Mother and Sons, there's no time for guilt. There's no time for recrimination. We need to care for those who are suffering, offering not consolation, but companionship. We are in this together. The greatest moment in McNally's Mothers and Sons is incredibly, unthinkably undramatic. This woman who has refused throughout the play to take off her coat, who wears it almost as a suit of armor, finally lets it fall to the ground and allows herself to be embraced by the lover of her long dead son. What gay theater has been able to do so effectively in response to the AIDS epidemic is to reach out and offer that kind of embrace to the audience. Thank you. Well, thank you, Raymond, for such a wonderful presentation. You know, this is what art does. This is what literature does. Gives us hope. Gives us compassion. And also allows us to lead life as it has to be led in spite of the saga of loss that a pandemic like AIDS can create. Without further ado, let me now throw open the session for questions and comments to the audience. And my friend and colleague, Dr. Somipendra Banerjee, will moderate this session. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Omita, yes. Uh, I've already, uh, you know, uh, wrote in the chat box that if there are any questions, uh, the participants may write it in the chat box. Um, sir, we have uh, uh, our first question uh, from Nubida Anjum, who is asking uh, uh, you to tell us something about the representation of AIDS in uh, U.S. lesbian theater scene. So, uh, yeah. Um. The only playwright I can mention offhand is Paula Vogel, a very important feminist playwright who, as uh, Omit Bhattacharya mentioned, uh, is the author of The Baltimore Waltz. Lesbians became tremendously important as caregivers. Uh, on the social scene at the height of the AIDS epidemic, in part because feminist communities were, at the time, much better organized than gay male communities were. But in terms of theater, Vogel is the only playwright I can think of offhand, and she was inspired to write by the death of her brother, uh, who was gay and who died of AIDS-related causes. Do you have other playwrights in mind? Whoever asked the question, uh, do you have other playwrights in mind? Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. No, sir. Sorry, I'm just learning to 
figure out what's happening on my screen since this is the first time I've used this forum. No, I, I mean, I would I can't offer you any other hmm. suggestions. No, I would. Uh, I mean, from the uh, experience in India, uh, what I would like to, I don't know if, if this is uh, right, but but the work in uh, as such, uh, you know, the LGBT uh, theater uh, is uh, slowly uh, gaining ground. But uh, in terms of research and uh, publication also, I mean, we are still, we have a long way to go, actually. Um, yeah. Well, in the United States, lesbian theater is, I would say, twen you know, a, a recognizable lesbian theater movement is probably only 25 to 30 years old and in a way postdates the AIDS crisis. So that is why I would think uh, that if one were to research the issue, I don't know that one would find many other lesbian um, playwrights addressing AIDS besides Vogel. Oh, yes. So Priyanka Bhakti is asking uh, about uh, you to tell something about Dublin Gay Theatre Festival. And uh, Shuprabhat Chatterjee has another question. Uh, sir, do you think AIDS uh, comes up as a site uh, to burst open the myth of stable heteronormative family? Uh, well, but that is not really... Sure. I, 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 the second question I, I, I can address. The first, I'm, I know that a lot of American gay plays 
get performed in Dublin and Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Fringe, uh, do does a very exciting theater. But since I don't have the resources to travel, I don't get to go over to uh, follow the see the uh, festivals there. One of the reasons, but as regards the second question, um, McNally titled his play, Mothers and Sons, it's a play upon Ivan Turgenev's novel, Fathers and Sons, clearly. But the play is a challenge to how family is constituted in the United States. And this is something that gay theater has always done. There was a musical made in the, oh, I think it was the early 1980s, mid-80s, called La Cage au Fol, which was based upon a French film farce. But it dealt with a gay, middle-aged gay couple who run a, a, a nightclub with female impersonators. Uh, and the play shocked, and it won the Tony Award for Best Play. Uh, the music was by Jerry Herman, who did Hello, Dolly, and Mame, and was a very popular musical playwright. The book was by Arthur Lawrence, who wrote the books for West Side Story and for Gypsy, two very important American musicals. Um, and the fact that at the end of the, of the play, the gay partner who has raised her spouse's son by an earlier marriage is the person that the son wants to acknowledge as his mother, not his biological mother from whom he's been estranged for so many years. This caused a furor in the New York City newspapers. And finally, the New York Times critic, Frank Rich, did a powerful essay on what constitutes a family and pointed out that what gay th theater presents are the way that gays are forced to create alternate families when they have been rejected by their biological family. One of my favorite plays by Terence McNally is titled Unusual Acts of Devotion. And it takes place in the 1960s on the roof of a brownstone apartment building in lower Manhattan. And it's a, a, it's a hot summer night before you had air conditioning widely available. And all the people in the apartment building go up on the roof at night to try and escape the heat of their apartments. And you realize that they have created a family that is much more powerful than the biological families that they were born into. This is a, a tremendously important theme in American gay drama. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, another question has come up, sir. Thank you. Uh, Uh, yes, I, uh, again, I can see the first two lines of the sentence, but uh, I, I can guess what the rest of the question was. Yeah, uh, I mean, the gap of, 
I'm reading it. I was, just, I was just reading uh, it because it's slightly long. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, why was there a gap of nearly a quarter of a century before new shows about AIDS gained uh, mainstream stages? Stages. And what is the situation now? How do these works differ from landmark plays such as Angels in America? The the twenty five year gap is relatively easy to account for. After nineteen ninety five, when AIDS became a manageable condition, it simply disappeared from public discourse in the United States. There was there was no longer a need for political activists to demand funding in health research. There was no longer the need for care organizations to um, care for people, for persons with AIDS. And once that urgency passed, plus I think that playwrights of my generation were simply so exhausted by the work they had done 
so brilliantly and in such short order that they felt there was nothing left to write. What you see happening in the late 1990s in American gay theater, a new issue arises, and that is marriage equality. And you start getting plays like McNally's Some Men in 2007, which addresses, which takes place, is framed by a gay wedding. And this becomes a much more pertinent and pressing social issue. And gay plays will take this on. And once the United States Supreme Court, three or four years ago, declared marriage equality the law of the land in the United States, plays about gay marriage are no longer being written, <laughs> simply because the issue has been resolved. Right, sir, yes. Uh... At that moment, another comes from Onik Dash, uh, who is asking, uh, sir, how un-American it was for American gay playwrights uh, before the Stonewall era to come out of their closet and were the play censored uh, in the Broadway by any public body as such? Yeah. Uh, no American playwright came out as gay before Stonewall, you had, everyone in the theater community knew that Tennessee Williams was gay. That was not a question. He was asked famously on a nighttime talk show if he was gay, and this is in the early 70s, and he said, well, let's just say I cover the waterfront, meaning that I um, have a wide variety of partners. But when you look at someone like Edward Albee, who, again, everyone knew was gay, but who did not write a gay character until Three Tall Women, his Pulitzer Prize winning play, Three Tall Women, in I think that's 1993 or 94, he wrote the play after his mother died. It was as though Albee could not acknowledge publicly that he was gay until his mother was gone. And Albee was in his late 60s at the time. Similarly, Albee's The Zoo Story, which established his reputation in 1960, was a groundbreaking play that created the off-Broadway theater movement. Albee's The Zoo Story for years had been discussed as dealing with a encounter between two gay men, one of whom is closeted in Central Park on a Sunday afternoon. It's a two-character two play that takes place on a park bench. Albee himself refused to discuss that possibility until 2006, he wrote At Home at the Zoo, a prelude to the zoo story in which the one character is at home with his wife and decides he's going to spend the afternoon in Central Park. 
And you realize only when you do the two plays together that the Zeus story is indeed a gay play. Now, Albee insisted that the Zeus story after 2006, you cannot produce the Zeus story without producing the prelude under the combined title At Home at the Zoo that he wanted the play to be read this way. But that is just 10 years before he died. He's in his 70s before he finally is willing to acknowledge the gay subtext to the zoo story. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, now the owners falls on me for the closing comments from the host. Well, uh, I must thank. Professor Ramon Ja Fontaine for such a wonderful session. He has not only raised very pertinent issues in his discussion of the gay uh, US gay theater, and he has also very patiently answered the questions that have been raised by our audience. So thank you for that. I must thank the audience also for being with us, even though this area is not that well researched over here, uh, they have really been with us despite the IPL. So thanks for that. You know, I think by way of my closing remarks, I should say that the AIDS epidemic and the crisis resulting from that gave to the LGBTQ movement both the space and the chance to at least highlight the fact that heteronormativity is not everything. And by standing together, standing for each other, as Professor Fontaine was talking about the role of the lesbians as caregivers, whereas the gay community was basically the host community suffering from AIDS, contracting HIV. So in a way, this gave the LGBTQ community the agency to point out themselves, not as aberrant, but as caring individuals and communities. So thanks all round. And with this, we come to the end of this session. But before we sign off, let me tell you that day after tomorrow, Professor Scott Slavik is going to deliver a lecture as part of the online lecture series that we are organizing. So I must invite all of you to be with us day after tomorrow. With this, we call it a day. Thank you. Good night to our, attend uh, our attendees. And good day to Professor Ramon Jafonte. <laughs>